Thanks to Jonas and Jerry. Those were amazingly interesting uh, talks. I had no idea. Um, I am not an academic. Um, I'm a writer, first and foremost. Um, so it was really interesting to get deep in the numbers there and see how the early industry worked. It feels a little high. Is that a little better? Okay. Um, so I'd just like to, I have no slides. This is a very uh, low tech um, talk. I'd like to just tell a story. Um, and so uh, you feel free to settle back in your seats, close your eyes if you want, take a deep breath. This is uh, more like a reading than a, than a lecture. Um, I'll just start. I'd like us to time travel one month and 223 years back. It's June 1795. There are only a few, peop few thousand people living on this island. There's no cars, no electricity, no penicillin, and you're standing on the top of Main Street, a few blocks away from here. It's an hour before dawn on the summer solstice when most of the town is out at washing ponds for the annual sheep shearing festival. It's the shortest night. The sky above you is ink black, the stars blotted out by the thick fog that has rolled in and is moving through the streets like it always does this time of year. The sheep storms, they call it. The fog wets your clothes and mists your face. You take a deep breath and you smell whale oil, fish, sewage, the tangy scent smoke from the peat fires lingering in town. The wind rustles the leaves on the beet, peach and cherry trees that have been planted around town. You hear the disembodied footsteps hurriedly clacking on the cobblestones, the sound of a man and woman talking in a nearby alley, the wooden creak and shift of a cart and a horse's fatigued metal footfalls. To your side, a man named Libius Coffin walks the street, mumbling to himself. The birds are starting up chattering in the trees, waiting for morning. You like early June. It seems like a hopeful time of year on island. The beginning of summer, when a few whale ships are due to return any day now with their, oil, with their hulls filled with oil. And suddenly, from down the street, you hear someone by the new bank, across from where the Ralph Lauren store is right now. <laughs> Open just a couple weeks. Through the fog, you see a silhouette of a young man at the door of the bank. There's a large sack at his feet. He peers anxiously up and down the street. He's dressed like a fisherman, and later in the month, exchanging some gold in a Philadelphia bank, he'll be disguised as a gentleman, dressed in crisp, clean clothes. This is John Clark, leader of the heist you're now witnessing, the first bank heist in American history. You hurry forward to investigate. You run down the street. On the way down, you see Rachel Gardner standing with the man. Her testimony of what you both are seeing right now will be dragged through the mud in the coming year because she's named as a local prostitute. You hide in the shadows across Union Street and watch. There's John, tying up a bag about the size of a pillowcase. He looks nervous because he spent longer in the bank than anticipated. John is from New Haven but he's been on Nantucket three times this past spring, each time to sell stolen goods like corn or flour. His father, a notorious thief in New England, has recently been in prison, accused of organizing tea heists. John's older brother, Sam, has been receiving letters from their father the past few months, describing ways to clear his name. The father and sons have been a family of thieves all their life. The Nantucket job, without a doubt, is the biggest heist they've ever attempted. All spring, they've been sitting in their kitchen table in New Haven, plotting, filling their tobacco pipes, sipping whiskey and cider, talking in the flickering candlelight. They've figured out where to get a schooner that won't be traced, and what day they will land. It will be now, on the solstice, when most people won't be alarmed to see strangers on the island because of the sheep shearing festival. Oddly, Sam, the older brother, doesn't join the heist. The job is given to John, the younger brother. Years later, in 1818, one of the bank directors will write about the Clark family, quote, 
perhaps there never was a set of thieves in the United States that conducted their business upon a larger scale or better calculated to carry it out with such perfection, end quote. Without a doubt, the Clark family could be called one of America's first mafias. Then out comes James Weatherly, born in Rhode Island. James lived in Newport until a particular humiliating experience when he was young, when he was strung up on the street corners and whipped publicly for burglary. He ran away and ended, end, ended up in New Haven, met the Clark family, became a protege of the old man, learned his tricks, and joined the sons in their exploits. James is a skilled and somewhat famous lockpicker. A judge in Providence once said of him, quote, if James Weatherly was on the island at the time of the Nantucket bank robbery, I know no other person in the United States to be so, likely to be so concerned in that business, end quote. It was James who, after breaking through five bank vaults with copies of keys he made earlier that day when depositing checks gotten from selling their stolen corn, picked a final surprise lock in a few hours with nothing but a pewter spoon. Depending on which state he's in and which town he's in, he calls himself Zeb Weathers, or James Coates, or James Smith, or William Sanford. James Weatherly is a Houdini of sorts, a ghost escaping almost every single prison he's been locked in, continuously tricking the world he isn't who he is. And finally, the third man out is Seth Johnson from south of Boston. He spent a lot of time in Boston prisons until he escaped, also ran, and ended up as well in New Haven to be folded into the Clark family mafia. Depending on where he's living, he calls himself George Jones or George Haddon or George Johnson. Seth, like the other two, has escaped from prisons almost as many times as he's been released. So here's the trio. The boss's son paired with two of the boss's best workers, three men from Connecticut coming to ransack the coffers of Nantucket. Together, they're cunning, daring, infamously cocky. Later, when John Clark and James Weatherly are brought back to Nantucket to face charges, they'll say to the prison guard that they have too many friends on Nantucket to ever be convicted, and they'll be right. In many ways, they are the opposite of the people whose money they are now stealing. They are the lowest rung of American society. They are common thieves, but they are about to commit a crime to rip the social fabric of one of America's highest societies. They are like a rusty blade cutting through fine lace. You follow the three men as they drag their bags through the foggy streets to the old North Wharf, where they will load it onto the schooner called the Dolphin, owned by a man named John Osborne, also from Connecticut. They've sailed the Dolphin from Staten Island to Nantucket with a stolen load of cornmeal, which they sold at a fraction of market value to the residents earlier that day. You board the boat with them. You sneak below the decks. Seth, John, and James throw lines off and hoist the sails. You look through the sacks of loot they just brought down. It's piled high, and weeks later, when the robbery is publicly announced, you hear the exact numbers of what you're looking at. It's astounding. 400 pieces of French gold, at French coined gold, at $1,700, 150 Spanish pistols, 800 English guineas at $1,500, hundreds of, hundreds of half guineas, pieces of gold called half joannes, 4,430 French crowns, $12,000, all of it totaling somewhere around $21,000, over a quarter million dollars in today's currency. The gray light of dawn smudges the sky. They slip out of the harbor without telling the customs collector, Stephen Hussey. The sun rises on this now longest day of the year. There's an easterly, and the boat rushes forward. The water clucks against the hull. There's excitement aboard. They've just made history. This, in one way, is the story of the 1795 Nantucket bank robbery. But the robbery is composed of many more stories than this at least five by my count, each one interesting in its own way, each one like a thread twisting and braiding down a line of mystery, threading back two centuries now. First and foremost, it is a story I just told you, the story simply of a lot of silver and a lot of gold going missing in a very short period of time. It's a story of three young delinquents who managed to puncture one of the wealthiest communities in America and get away with it. The story of cunning and of luck, in many ways, it's a story that seems fated to happen, 
an island glutted with money and isolationist naivete, like a piggy bank waiting to be shattered, is a story of a community sucker punched by crime. But later it will become a story of injustice, plain and simple, of inadequacy of the fledgling American legal system, because all the wrong men will be accused and all the criminals will continually get, it, get away. This is a story of corruption, of bribes, false accusations, rampant perjury, the failures of criminology, and a truly bizarre testimony, which includes one from an astrologer, another from a phrenologist, and a third from a man who made a deposition based on a recollection of his dream. The story includes, for instance, that I have a man, the local director of the slaughterhouse, a man named Randall Rice, convicted of sitting in a Boston prison for years, away from his wife and kids, writing the governor of Massachusetts in a desperate last plea to be pardoned for a crime he certainly didn't commit. This story includes portraits of many men and women who were ruined by injustice on Kafkaesque proportions. Much later, only in hindsight, only in the hindsight of many decades, it will become the story of a small town at the beginning of the end of its golden age. It will, in many ways, be seen as a final blow to the great old Nantucket of the 18th century, the Nantucket which had tempted Ishmael, the Nantucket that had become famous through around the watery world. The robbery will become the story of how one crime can break a community's social harmony, its sense of trust and its familial closeness. The botched investigation and its aftermath will pit Quakers against Congregationalists, Macy's against Coffins, Federalists against Democrats, Islanders against Off-Islanders, off -islanders, and many more. It will be an open wound of bitterness to cut straight across Nantucket in the afterglow of wealth and adventure that had given the island its most mythical status. It will be a data point in the line of Nantucket's decline between the American Revolution, the shift of Yankee whaling to New Bedford, the Great Fire of 1846, and other devastating events. But for now, let's get back to sea, to the joyride of those Connecticut boys with their many gold coins stashed in the getaway schooner. They offload their loot down the coast. They're like squirrels hiding nuts. John Clark hides his share, $8,000 worth in gold, $8,000 in $70.95, of gold and silver somewhere in, by the New Haven waterfront. He'll later come back to it and bury it in the family farm, putting some of it in a wooden box under his barn. In New Haven, the owner of the schooner, who's been pretending to be sick in order to sign the boat over to John Clark, boards. You sail to Great Captains, a tiny island south of Greenwich, Connecticut. There, you watch them bury the mother load, $10,000 worth of coins. John Clark and John Osborne, the owner of the vessel, take the schooner to New York City shipyard. They strip it and destroy any evidence. Clark, after days without sleep and hauling bags, retires to room over a porterhouse on Ann Street, right near where City Hall is today. In the porterhouse and inn, the porterhouse and inn is owned by a man who John Clark later employs to make more sacks for shuffling around the, ca the cash. Meanwhile, back on Nantucket, it's total mayhem. After the robbery is discovered by the cashier, the 12 bank directors keep it quiet for five days, fearing that there'll be hysteria and a run on the bank. Finally, on June 26th, a general alarm is raised in order to allow for transfer of additional capital so the bank won't fold. A man who lived through it describes the local scene like this, quote, what could be more sudden? Or what could even, ha what even could happen that would give a greater shock to us? The people were not in the least suspicious of the act. Consequently, they were not prepared to receive the information. The event could not but excite the greatest anxiety on the public mind that could be imagined and cause them to leave their business, to throng in the streets for days. A bank robbery at its core is a violation of a community, a reduction of wealth, of, co of collective wealth gotten from labor. If money is a representation of a person's time and energy, then this crime must have stuck, stung Nantucketers who, risked their, who, for money, risked their lives at sea with particular potency. On Monday, June 29th, a $1,000 reward is offered for any information on the criminals. An announcement is circulated listing the reward with a note that begins, quote, whereas some evil-minded person or persons about the 20th June instant in the night season, aided by false keys or otherwise, entered the Nantucket Bank, end quote. Rumors start to fly. 
Here the fractures start, hairline cracks that will turn into valleys of hatred. One bank director blithely accuses another of organizing the heist in order to buy up all the oil coming in that summer and thereby cornering the market. Another bank director accuses a local of simply looking guilty, which will eventually lead to his imprisonment. People pick sides, but it is unanimously agreed that the culprits must be Nantucketers. By June 26th, five days after the heist, Randall Rice, the slaughterhouse director, and father and son Joseph and William Nichols are arrested on warrants. Libius Coffin, the man you saw wandering at the top of Main Street on the solstice, says he had a dream about Randall Rice robbing the bank. Rachel Gardner, the woman who you saw in an alleyway with a man, gives a testimony that's first embraced and then dismissed, as I said, likely because she's a prostitute. The bank president consults an astrologer in Rhode Island who, claim, who names the guilty parties in accordance to the planets and sun that correspond with physical and temperamental characteristics. One robber is blonde, the other is swarthy, another mercurial, one is solar, wrathful, or Martian. All the accusers turn out to be Quakers, and so they win the support of the town. Samuel Barker and Jethro Hussey are eventually accused as also being part of the heist. A sweaty hanker white handkerchief is found in the bank vault and is said, is said to be owned by one of the accused, which amazingly seem, turns out to be a substantial piece of evidence, even though nobody can prove who the real owner of the handkerchief is. The list, list of the accused grows by mid-July, now including William Coffin, Albert Gardner, Josiah Hussey, Josiah Barker, and Samuel Barker. By late August, a U.S. Marshal is finally summoned. He ransacks the house of Josiah Barker on a hunch that the money will be there, but finds nothing and essentially throws his hands up, giving up the search. In short, as I said in Nantucket, it's total mayhem. Meanwhile, the money's being spent. The four Connecticut men, including the ship owner, are acting like spring breakers with mommy and daddy's credit card. They sail to the West Indies. They buy a few boats. They buy land. They steal tea and corn from merchant vessels. They go to prison. They break out of prison. They go to prison. They break out again. Money, but the party really doesn't last forever. On a spree through Philadelphia, and this is just by July now, on a spree through Philadelphia in July, Johnson and Weatherly are captured and found carrying $4,000 worth of gold on their person. The mayor of Philadelphia has heard of the Nantucket bank robbery, and seeing so much gold, he suspects them. He puts them in prison, and then they do what they always do, which you can guess, they escape. Summer passes, and more problems arise for the loose-lipped robbers. A New Haven neighbor named Leverett Stevens, for instance, here's John Clark talking about the heist and where he's hiding some of the cash. With two friends in the middle of the night, Leverett Stevens digs up the money under the barn. Surprised that he finds thousands of French crowns and not enough pocket, he takes off his hat, fills his hat, then takes off his boots, fills his boots, and then runs away barefoot with his boots under his arms. Weatherly and Johnson both brag about the heist seemingly to whomever will listen. They move the money around, they go from Great Captain's Island to City Island near Cow Bay, they bury a bit in Long Island, they fight, at one time Weatherly holds a gun to Johnson's head and prevents him from getting a share of the money. That's a, it's a really Hollywood-like moment, that, that description. So autumn comes. This is all like three months. A trial of the accused Nantucketers begins. The witness list, uh, the witness list is pages long and includes nobody that who actually saw or has any credible information of the heist. One man redacts his testimony, says he was bribed to give it. The community is clenched in frantic conspiracy theories and mounting anger. Finally, Joseph Chase, the bank director and former whaleman of the, with the Roach whaling fleet out of England and France, decides to go on a secretive investigative journey in, on his own one cold February day in 1796. He travels to New Haven, then New York, then Philadelphia. It's there in Philadelphia he finds Weatherly, the famous lockpicker, in prison. Chase puts him in chains, and he brings him back to Nantucket. During the journey back, Weatherly confesses his crime without much worry. Two months later, mm, Weatherly's put in the Nantucket, on the high, in the High Street prison, the old jail in Nantucket. Two months later, in 1796, in April of 1796, John Clark, the younger son of the mafia boss, who had been cruising the Bahamas, is found in New York City and hauled back to Nantucket, also back to the old jail on High Street. After 10 months, 
Clark and Weatherly are finally reunited back on Nantucket. They're kept in the same cell, and I really have to wonder what the Nantucketers were thinking then, putting a man who could literally pick his way through six bank vault locks with a spoon with another who seems by all accounts a brilliant con artist, a master of deception and disguise, with crime literally in his blood. So you can see what happens. John Clark confesses to the jailkeeper, Daniel Kelly, or Killy, to spend you know, just various spellings, and adds that he has, again, quote, more friends on Nantucket than the accused. When Kelly relays to the director's Clark's confession, a key figure in the, uh, sorry. When Kelly relays the, to the director's Clark's confession, Cl Kelly, the jail guard, is fired. A side note on the corruption, which is so long here that I could like simply give that story um, and it would take up pages. But here's just like two examples. Um, Sylvanus Macy, who was the great, great, great of Macy's department, you know, um, a key figure in the accusations, one time offers a witness $3,000 to stick to his story. Another, Abner Coffin, went down to New York City and paid two men to say they saw Weatherly in New York City at the time of the robbery. Clark and Weatherly break out of jail. <laughs> they first hide in the old rope works, and then they hide in, then they hide in the moors. They're hoofing it west. They're hoofing it east. <laughs> because two weeks later, they're at the Great Point Lighthouse. I got my Nantucket geography mixed up. They're at the Great Point Lighthouse, all the way across the island. And it's in these two weeks that are fertile ground for conspiracy theories, or maybe books. Who fed them and who gave them water? Phineas Fanning had been in jail with Phineas Fanning had been in jail with Clark and Weatherly on trumped up debt charges just before he was freed, and he made a secretive long trip to Long Island. And guess what he was going to look for? Did he tell them that his wife would give him shelter after they escaped in exchange for the location of the gold? Or what about the many bank directors doing, doing seemingly everything in their power to keep alive the story about the wrongly accused Randall Rice and Hussies? Whatever the case, the new prison guard now noticed the convicts missing about June 8th, and then Paul Pinkham, the Great Point lighthouse keeper at the time, notes that he saw the robbers stealing his life-saving boat on June 21st. That's a difference of 13 unaccounted for days. While I was doing this research, by the way, side note, I just walked from here to the Great Point Lighthouse to see how long it would take you, and it does not take you 13 days. After stealing Paul Pinkham's boat, the two are never, ever seen on Nantucket again. The Nantucket Bank was built because the town leaders thought it would be a good idea for starting and diversifying business. As Jonas said, um, by the 1830s, whaling had shifted to New Bedford, maybe they're reading the writing on the wall. They knew that they had it to get more businesses on island than just whaling. One Nantucketer wrote, notwithstanding the various vicissitudes of fortune, the discouraging prospects which often presented to view, yet the wealth of the inhabitants was rather increasing, which led to the enterprising genius to contemplate projects to acquire an increased pro property. One of which, and not the least, was to establish a bank. Being a novel undertaking for the people of Nantucket, many revolted to the idea. Others urged the public utility. And so the bank was eventually incorporated with a capital stock of forty dollars to $100,000 shares of $100 each. But still there was some confusion and resistance to the bank. One story goes that when a man was paid with a check, he went home, showed it to his wife, who asked what it was, and he yelled, It's a chuck, and it's deviltry, and I want nothing of it and then he threw the chuck into the fire. And it turns out the old timer might have been right. Because in many ways, the bank brought more deviltry to the island than good. Obed Macy, who lived through robbery, wrote, quote, the loss, of the, the loss of the money was not a consideration compared with the vindictive spirit which the robbery afterwards occasioned. The effects of the community at large were solemn. Many who were not immediately concerned had to deplore the unhappy state in which their friends and their neighbors were involved in and out of reach of a mediator." End quote. As I quoted, the bank was established to nudge Nantucket into the 19th century, to grow business out of the rich ground that its whaling history had given the island. And yet, 
the bank seems to trip up the island rather than helping it forward. In my most poetic state of mind, it seems I sometimes see the robbery as a sign that Nantucket just couldn't do business as usual, that fate wouldn't let it step into modern times and the natural rhythm of other thriving and developing towns, that it wasn't a typically prosperous community with a predictable trajectory, but more, that Nantucket and its people were part of a brief but perfectly executed idea that burned fast and wildly and brilliantly, like a comet passing between the constellations of US history. Here was an island home to people that for generations hunted the world's largest animals with preternatural ability and passion, and because of which could never quite step past their own history. When they tried, they were clobbered by crime. Here was a town that never locked its doors and now was filled with perjurers, with liars, with false witnesses, bribers, raging plaintiffs, disbelieving defendants, and feuds that literally lasted a lifetime. They were dragged through the mud, and here was a town now changed. As for the robbers, where did they end up? John Osborne, the owner of the getaway schooner, bought a farm and another boat to start a passenger and freight service between New York and North Carolina. Seth Johnson escaped from prison in Philadelphia and was apparently seen, last seen, riding a horse across a Canadian border. <laughs> I love that image. James Weatherly lived in New York, James Weatherly, the expert lock picker, bought two farms, but he eventually, of course, ended up back in prison in New York City, and he died there. And the Clarks, the father bought a sloop in New Haven, a sloop and left New Haven. His wife gave a deposition against him and her sons, John and Samuel. He was last seen near New, Provi near New Providence, one of the Bahamian Islands, in something like a cushy retirement, as I see it, away from his wife and kids and New England winters, living in the tropics, living off the gold he had his youngest son steal in the middle of the night. And John Clark Jr., the leader of the heist, the one who did his father's bidding. He went to Vi Virginia and then maybe England. Perhaps he'd had enough of America. Nobody really knows, and it's too far in the past. His death disappeared into the fog of time. But one of my favorite quotes of John's comes in an answer to a deposition taken in New Haven. When asked if he was, quote, certain that he was not in Nantucket in the Sloop Dolphin in June of 1795, John answers, I am not positive. I can almost hear his cockiness, his self-assuredness. They stopped the deposition there. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I just want to keep time it short. for questions. So, yeah, so we could I could answer a few questions. Um, any questions about the robbery? I don't know where the gold is. What's, what? Oh, right. Um, okay, I've said this before. Researching this has been like trying to penetrate a billiard ball. Because it's like every time you try to get an angle, there's so much information and misinformation and misinformation and so much deception that you don't really know. Like even the story I just told you, I'm not sure is true. It's an accepted story that was told in the early 1800s through a bunch of depositions taken. Where the cash was buried also was, um, it was from William Coffin who did his own research about that. And um, so he took a lot of depositions and he sort of drew up a list of where he thought all the money was. Yeah, uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. On High Street, James would. On High Street. <laughs> they, they built a new jail explicitly because of their escape. High Street is the last cross street before you get to Main Street between Pleasant and Pine. Okay. There you go. I cut across the road. It's right, it, it leads to, it's just one street in from the street that goes in front of the Sun Street Church. Hmm.
So I know you said there are layers of corruption that are a story unto themselves, but can you give an example of one motivation for the kind of you know, obf obfuscation going on in terms of paying uh, certain witnesses to give false testimony? Why were they so wedded to the idea of the accused on the island being guilty? Right, I, they started accusing people, with, as you can see, within a week or two. Um, and I, I mean, um, I think this has a lot, this is like a story of human nature. When you start, I mean, this is not the first time, <laughs> say, there's not the first time that people have been falsely accused, accused. The accusers have stuck with it through everything, through seemingly all the evidence going against them. And this is where I start to, again, there's so many conspiracies all I can do is present a picture, but there's so many conspiracy theories that can happen. I mean, there were letters going back and forth between the Quakers in New Bedford and Nantucket. That whale oil, because of this robbery, was not all bought up at that time. It, businesses came to a standstill. Um, I wonder if some people are trying, it really sat, it looks like some people are trying to put others in prison. I mean, you read this and it just sort of looks like Soviet era you know, like it's just crazy how committed they were. I don't, I don't have an answer. I don't know. As I said, I've tried to find the real story over and over and over. And I can't quite get at it. I, I think that's because there's so m people. Everybody's defending themselves, and everybody is lying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you did you document or find out or how do we know that this was the first bank robbery? Um, who has an iPhone? <laughs> if you could, you Google America first bank robbery, <laughs> and just tell me what you see. Was the butcher ever cleared and released from jail? He was. The governor gave him a pardon because it was so obvious what had happened. Yep. You might see a painting. And so there's a link there. Click that link. It's ushistory.org, which looks like a site made by a middle schooler, actually. But yeah, and there's a, sen there's a, there's a first sentence in there. I could have said. In. Seventeen ninety eight. The, the most commonly um, accepted first bank robbery in America is a Philadelphia bank robbery of 1798. And it's famous because, again, this seems to be a horrible, horrible uh, pattern in bank robbery investigations. A man was falsely accused. It was, they thought it was the, um, uh, the blacksmith who made the keys for the bank. And so that man, that painting, is a painting of the blacksmith that after he earned a lot of money and after his name was cleared and the bank is in the background, him showing pretty much like to all the bank directors <laughs> that I, I wasn't real. So 7098, so this is three years before that. If there was another bank robbery, I can't find it, but 7095, so by all accounts, it's the first bank robbery in American history. And it was quite a big one. That Philadelphia bank robbery was insanely huge though. That was a big one, yeah. Okay, thank you, Ben. Thanks so much. <laughs>